there are few things in sport as rewarding as knocking down 10 pins on one single shot. And what is more fun than throwing one strike? The ability to throw more than one strike over and over again consistently. When someone throws that perfect strike or their best shot, the first thing out of their mouth is, wow, that was easy, that was so simple. The next thing out of their mouth, why can't I do that every time? When everything clicks and you're just like, I want to do that again, can I, can I just take that and redo it now every time? That's the million dollar question we're here to answer for you. So our job is to figure out why it isn't so easy every time, where it goes wrong, and how to fix it. Since lesson one with Mark, uh, my average is well over 210. Uh, I've had a 300 game. Uh, I've shot a 700 series. And uh, the, the landmarks, the, the milestones are just tremendous and incredibly gratifying. Together, we are going to go through a system to help you achieve that best shot more consistently with power. And if we can do that, you can ball those scores you've always dreamed of. Hi, my name is Mark Baker, and I'm a professional bowling instructor. And what does that mean? It means I do one thing for a living. I help bowlers. Now, I've gotten a lot of press helping some guys who are pretty good. You may have heard of them. Chris Barnes, Tommy Jones, Bill O'Neill, Mike Fagan, Mika Koivinemi. Those guys are a pleasure to work with. But what I really do is help bowlers like you on a daily basis. I work with bowlers from 225 all the way down to people who come to my Saturday clinic with no ball and no shoes of their own. And I have one job. I make everybody better that I come in contact with. That's what this DVD is about, to make you a better bowler. So, what is the number one thing bowlers want? It's one thing, to make you be more consistent. I get it every day when I get phone calls for lessons, people come to my Camp Bakes, the Baker Barnes Clinics, or my Saturday Clinic with Barry Asher. How do I throw my best shot more consistently? And it comes at me in a bunch of different ways. Whether it's falling off at the foul line, I can't hit my target consistently, I can't post a shot more consistently, but everybody wants the same thing. The purpose of this whole DVD is to get you to throw your best shots more consistently. Whether you're a 105 bowler wanting to hit the head pin five times a game instead of two, you're at 140 and you want to get to 170 by throwing three or four good shots a game, or probably the most common thing I get, 185 to 210, you're throwing four or five good shots a game, but you can't throw seven. And then there's the extreme, Mr. Barnes, about nine or 10 really good shots a game, who thinks he should be able to throw 12 perfect shots a game every game of his life. Sorry, Chris, that's not happening. But it's always the same thing. I want to be more consistent. I get it. The whole purpose of this DVD is for you to make your best shots with more consistency. Oh yeah, they also want a second thing. And they always say it like this, I want to be more consistent. And can you add a little bit of power? Especially my male clients ages 12 to 70. We all want our ball to hit a little bit harder. Who doesn't like snapping the 10 pin or throwing that head pin back across the deck and snapping out the 10? Okay, back to the consistency issue. We all want to throw it more consistent with power. And now we're gonna to talk to a few of your fellow bowlers to see what they want. My biggest frustration is uh, inconsistency. What goes through my head and maybe because I'm a perfectionist is, oh, I got a strike. What did I do right? I figured like there are so many elements, right? What ball you use, the oil on the lane, how you slide, everything. So if I'm not consistent, no matter what ball I use, no matter how hard I throw, no matter like how I adjust, like what mark should I, I wouldn't know if I'm doing it right. My footwork is the, probably the most inconsistent part of my game for me. Because if that's off, it doesn't matter about the rest of it. The best feeling I had was like, when I threw it, as soon as the ball leaves your hand, you know that it's a strike. When you throw a perfect strike, everything is in just perfect time. It feels literally like nothing. It, the ball doesn't feel heavy in your hand. It just comes off completely in time, and it, the ball just goes on to lane. You don't hear anything until the ball actually hits the pins, and it shreds the rack. 
when you get a strike and you and, and you have that feeling for the game, it's just such a different feeling. Especially when you're doing strike after strike after strike, then you're just like, oh my gosh, you know, wow. I'm looking to get to a point where I feel I can be competitive. Um, I want to be able to go into tournaments and know that no matter what's out there, I feel I can be competitive. I'm a 215 average bowler now. I'd love to get, you know, had another 10 pins. I'd love to be mid 220s. I want to be able to compete in tournaments. You know, go tournaments and bowl consistently and, and not have that one bad game that knocks you out of the tournament. So where did the system really start? Well, the system started when I needed to find somewhere to measure timing that hadn't been measured before. Why? The game of bowling has changed quite a bit in the last 30 years, and it's changed in three ways. First, it changed on the lane surface. All the lanes now are almost all synthetics. 30 years ago, we bowled on a lot of wood, and wood is a soft surface, synthetics is a hard surface, that changed. Number two, the amount of oil on the lane now is much greater than it was 30 years ago. Why? We have oil machines. Nobody does them by hand anymore. When I bowl, we did a spray gun. A light mist went on the lane. Now they do every board individually with a jet. A lot more oil. And number three, the bowling balls. The bowling balls are amazing today. And what do they do? They hook. And they're going to keep hooking. Every year they come out with a new ball, they're going to hook a little bit more. That's probably the biggest change in our sport. So the three integers influencing our sport have changed quite a bit. What does that have to do with measuring timing? And more importantly, what does it have to do with coming up with a system that can help all bowlers? Well, through the years, they've always measured timing in your push away. Now, let's say you have a four step approach. Here's how they always measured it. If you move the ball and your foot at the same time, you were considered in time. If you move the ball first, but not your foot, you were considered early timing and if you moved your foot and not the ball, you were considered late timing. But the problem with that was, it wasn't a good way to measure who was a good and bad bowler. There were just as many great bowlers who moved the ball early as there were bowlers who moved the ball late and bowlers that moved the ball in time. So as a coach, and for you as a bowler, what was the right way? Then I discovered a similarity that is shared by most of the best modern day players. Regardless of their push away, when their slide foot got flat in front of their head, their swing got parallel to the ground. When I saw this, a giant light bulb went off over my head. Hey, I have now found a timing spot that works for me as a coach. So guess what I did next? I started looking at all my amateur bowlers, and guess what? They didn't get there very often. So what did I do? I spent the next six months to nine months working with all my amateurs just trying to get them to the timing spot. And guess what? They got better. Their consistency got better, their balance got better, and their shots got stronger. It was so good, about a year later, I quit my job, became a full-time bowling instructor, and now I'm talking to you. And then I started looking for other similarities with the best bowlers in the world, regardless of their push away or their style. Were there other positions they all matched? And guess what? There are. Then I quickly realized with my amateurs, if I could start to get them in more and more of these Hall of Fame positions, their scores would go up dramatically. So this is how the DVD works. I'm going to use Hall of Fame caliber bowlers who have different pushaways and different styles as my models. What do the models all have in common? They hit all 10 of the Hall of Fame positions. Next, I'm going to tell you where to videotape your own game from so you can see how many positions you currently hit in your game. Next, we go through the system. I'll talk about all the positions in detail and the changes you can make in your game so you can start to match those positions. Now, once you start to match those positions, I guarantee you, you'll become more consistent, your shots will become more powerful, and more importantly, your scores will start to go up. Now, let's meet the models. Model number one is Chris Barnes. Chris has succeeded at every level of bowling in which he's ever competed. 
He's been the PBA Rookie of the Year, the PBA Player of the Year. He's also one of six players to win the PBA Triple Crown. The hallmark of Chris's game is exceptional footwork. This allows him to repeat shots over and over, even under the most demanding conditions. It's also allowed him to be one of the most versatile bowlers in the history of the tour. Chris has what is called a late push away, but the rest of his fundamentals and timing are as good as it gets. So if you're a bowler that puts the ball into your swing very, very late, Chris is gonna be the bowler you want to emulate. Model number two is Tommy Jones. Tommy is also a former PBA Rookie of the Year and a PBA Player of the Year. When the PBA named their 50 greatest bowlers of all time, he was the youngest bowler selected. Tommy is known for his power game, but he's also a shot maker. With a win in several top five appearances in the US Open, which is our sport's most demanding condition, you can tell Tommy can make shots. Tommy's push away is early, and his feet are much quicker than Chris's. So if you have an early swing, you like to have quick feet, you have a rev rate over 400, and you're young and athletic, Tommy Jones is the model for you. Model number three is Linda Barnes. Linda is one of the most decorated bowlers in the history of the game. She's been a member of Team USA 10 times. Twice, she won the USBC Queens. She's in both the World Bowling Hall of Fame and the USBC Hall of Fame. Linda Barnes has one of the most textbook games you'll ever see. At just five feet, four inches, she's able to generate plenty of power while having complete control over her direction. So if you're a bowler with slight stature, or you have a hard time generating power, but you want to have great direction, then Linda's game is the one you want to model yours after. Model number four is Barry Asher. Barry is a USBC Hall of Famer and a PBA Hall of Famer. When they voted the 50 greatest players of all time, Barry was definitely on that list. And even at the age of 67, Barry's game has stood the test of time. We are using Barry on this DVD for a specific reason. The most common question I got after my book came out was, hey, I'm a senior, I'm brought across the shoulders, I've had an injury, I can't get my swing high enough to get to the timing spot. That being said, can I still be a good and effective bowler? The answer is yes. We are gonna use Barry to show examples of how if your swing isn't in the timing spot, you can still be a really good bowler. So obviously, if you can finish like our four models, you've achieved every shot's objective. But if you can't, something in the system had to break down. Now the system to me is in a giant circle, and the circle has two halves. It has direction, and it has speed control. All the bowling terms, which we're gonna go over later in detail, are somewhere in the circle. And all the bowling terms are connected. If you don't have balance at the end, something somewhere earlier had to go wrong. It's our job to find those things. But more importantly, before we even get there, we have to know where to film from. What do I mean by that? If you're going to use this DVD effectively, you're gonna stop it in certain spots to see the models. Well, you need to be able to stop yourself in the exact same spot to compare to see if you match up or not. We are gonna show you exactly where to film from. One of the biggest phenomena going on in our sport the last two or three years Everybody is videotaping everybody. What do I mean by that? People are using their phones, their iPads, their tablets, or like what I use, a regular camera, and everybody is videotaping everybody. And guess what? I agree with it. Now in making this DVD, one of the goals we were trying to accomplish was for you to be able to use the DVD as a comparison to your game. Once you find the model you want to use, you need to be able to take whatever you're taping and put it next to the DVD. Well, the only way this is going to work is if you film from the exact same spots I film from. We want you to have the same perspective. So, we already know you guys are out there filming yourselves. But the one thing I do notice is the randomness of where you film from. Nobody films anybody from the same place twice. I actually walk up to people on the lanes and ask them, why are you filming from there? I get the same answer every time. I don't know, we're just trying to get better. Nobody's ever told us where to film from. Well, that's the purpose of this DVD, to tell you specifically where to film from. We actually have some rules for it. But first, let's see some of the most common mistakes people make while filming themselves. Mistake number one, when filming from the back. 
they film really, really low to get the footwork, or they film from very high to just see the swing. The footwork and the swing are intricately related. You need to see them both. Another thing I see when people film from the back is they don't get directly behind the throwing shoulder. They'll get very off to the left or they'll get way off to the right. Now here's where I film from. I get directly behind the throwing shoulder. And what am I trying to accomplish? By the crossover step, I want to be able to see the feet as well as the swing, the entire approach. Now why is that? Because the footwork and the swing are so intricately related, I need to see both the entire approach. When filming from the side, I see two very common mistakes. The first mistake is my favorite. The person filming gets right next to the bowler while they're throwing the shot. They actually almost touch them. And as they take their approach, they walk with them and try to film it side by side. The reason why this doesn't work, it's almost impossible to keep the camera level or your filming device level through the entire shot. And more importantly, you're not gonna get that excellent sequence of events from the pivot step through the release point. You also have similar issues if you try to film from the front part of the approach. Now in filming from the side, I have to be in the exact same place every day. And why is that? Because I coach all over the world, whether I'm in Thailand, Sweden, Singapore, New York, Florida, Nevada, or at my home house, Fountain Bowl, I'm always standing in the same place. Now where do I stand? I'm always two lanes over from the bowler, meaning if the bowler's on lane eight, I'm on lane 10. Now I anchor my right foot in the same place every time. My heel is either up against the foul line unit or against the gutter cap. The right side of my foot is always parallel to the foul line. Now where am I looking? I'm gonna center the bowler exactly in the middle of the frame of my camera. I don't want him on the left side. I don't want him on the right side. I want him directly in the middle. Now I track him the entire approach all the way through his finish position. And when he's done throwing the shot, I keep my camera there for an extra second and I hit stop. I never track the ball going down the lane. The third place to film from is when I wanna see the ball motion. For this, I have to get up above the bowler. Cause when I mention from the side and also from the back, I never track the ball on those shots. I wanna see what the bowler looks like throwing the ball. But when I do wanna see ball motion and show it to the bowler, I have to get higher than the bowler. So I go up on the settee or I go up on the concourse and I film directly when the ball comes off his hand all the way through the pin deck. So now that you know the three places to film from, you need to know what to look for when you start to break down video. Now in using my system, there are very specific spots I look at when I assess a bowler's game. I call these the Hall of Fame positions. The reason, most bowlers in the Hall of Fame tend to get to all these spots. Now, are there exceptions? Of course there is. Remember, there isn't just one way to throw a bowling ball. Matter of fact, there isn't a wrong way to throw a bowling ball. But there are ways that are more consistent than others. And the people who throw it really, really, really consistent all reside in the same place, the Hall of Fame. But by and large, especially over the last 20 years, with all the advancements in technology, these positions have become more and more prevalent. Now I guarantee you, as you start to work on your game, if you can get in these Hall of Fame positions, you'll become more consistent, you'll add power, and most importantly, your scores will go up dramatically. Now let's look at the 10 Hall of Fame positions. The first five Hall of Fame positions are from the back. And position number one is the stance. And what I'm looking for here is that the ball is not visible from behind. Hall of Fame position number two is the position of the ball at the top of the backswing. I like to see it either cover or line up with the bowler's head. Hall of Fame position number three is the pivot step. And what I'm looking for here is for the position of the foot to be slightly inside the head. Hall of Fame position number four is the slide. I want to see the slide occur on the same board as the pivot step and also for it to be very straight. Hall of Fame position number five is the position of the ball at release. And just like the top of the swing, I like to see the ball under the head in this position as well. The next five positions are from the side view. And the first takes place during the push away. What I'm looking for here is for the shoulder to be quiet as the ball starts into the downswing. 
Hall of Fame position number seven is the pivot step. And what I'm looking for here is for the head to be on top of the pivot step. Hall of Fame position number eight is the timing spot, which is the centerpiece of the entire system. The hallmark of the timing spot is when the slide foot gets flat in front of the bowler's head, then the swing is parallel to the floor. Hall of Fame position number nine is the position of the head in relation to the knee at the release point. And what I'm looking for here is that your head not be past your knee. And the last of the Hall of Fame positions I look for is the back leg gap, which is the amount of space between your front leg and your back leg in your finished position. And that's it. Now, not only do you know where I film from, you also know what I look for when I give a lesson. Next, I'm going to take you step by step through every part of the game so you can begin working to match as many of the Hall of Fame positions as possible. Now, if you're a 17 year old boy who's not going to watch the rest of the DVD, you're just going to go out, film yourself, find those three or four Hall of Fame positions you don't match and try to fix it all in one shot, which is exactly what I would have done as a 17 year old. Please slow down. The DVD isn't meant to work that way. To use it the most efficient manner, you need to start in the beginning of the approach and work your way to the end of the approach. And why is that? If you fix one or two things in the very beginning, the things at the end may go away. Now it's time to get started. Now we're ready for the fun stuff. Now we're ready to start assessing your game. If you can't look like one of the four models, we got to figure out where to start. And the easiest way to start is in the stance. So when it comes to the stance, I'm only looking for two main things. Is it simple and is it balanced? And how can you tell if it's correct? Because it shouldn't take you much time to get into your stance. Look at Linda, look at Chris, look at Tommy. It's a very simple thing to get into their stance. I'm ready to bowl. That's all the effort your stance should take. I'm completely balanced and it was very simple to get here. Now what's the bonus feature for this? If you bought this DVD, you bought it for a reason. You want to get better. And if you get better, you're going to have to bowl under pressure situations. Now pressure can come to us in many different ways. Need a strike to win a game for your team and league. Need a strike to win a side pot. Need a strike to win a bracket. Or my personal favorite, you may need to bowl better to beat that guy in league you can't stand. You know the guy. When you look at the league sheet every week to see what you shot, and the very next name you look at is that guy you can't stand to make sure you beat him last week, you may draw him this week. And if your stance is simple and your stance is balanced, you have a better chance of beating him. Or if you're Chris and Tommy, you may need to strike on TV to win another PBA title. Well, that stance better be simple under that much pressure. Now, besides being simple and balanced, you'll notice that a lot of good bowlers have very, very similar stances. And what does it look like? It looks like this. You'll notice their throwing shoulder slightly below their other shoulder. Their head leans slightly to the right, but it's not outside your hips. Why? For one, I really want it balanced and two, I coach a lot of senior bowlers. I want something they can do to get in their stance that doesn't hurt their body. Now, when looking at the stance from the front, I can also address the number one question I'm asked. Where do I hold the ball? And the answer is simple, on the seam of your shirt. Every shirt you have has a seam where the sleeve actually meets the shirt. So if you line the ball up on that every time, you're in complete balance. And secondly, I can't see the ball from the back when the ball's in that position. Now, if you look at our models, Chris, Tommy, and Linda, I never even mentioned this to them. And guess where that ball's lined up? On the seam of their shirt. So what are some of the most common mistakes I see people make in the stance? The most common is that a lot of bowlers will start off okay, and then they want to get comfortable. Let's have a look at our amateur bowler, Matt. Matt looks okay here. 
But then, before he starts his approach, he tries to get comfortable and he moves the ball out to the right. So it is now visible from behind. If you were to draw a line from the ball back through the middle of his forearm, where is the line pointing? It's pointing at the seven pin on the next lane over. That doesn't mean he's not going to be able to hit his target, but now he's going to have to make some kind of compensation to get his swing on line with his target during the approach. In the case of Matt, if the push away follows on that same line, then the tendency will be to bring the ball back behind his head in the swing. Now, if you were to draw a line through the ball in his arm, he's still aimed at the seven pin on the next lane over. From here, in order to get the ball back on line with his target, he's going to have to slide back to the right, causing the ball to swing well away from his ankle. His hand is now on the upper right part of the ball, and it's very difficult to throw the ball on his intended target line. So, if you struggle with consistency and a lack of power, a simple change to your stance may help you to fix some of those flaws without having to do anything else. But, if you already have a stance like our models and you still struggle with consistency and power, we're going to have to find the fix somewhere else. Let's figure out what every shot's objective is when you throw a bowling ball. I know, I know, every shot's objective is to throw a strike. I get it. But when I watch somebody bowl and I coach them, every shot you throw has an objective, and it comes down to four things. Start and balance, create or build momentum to have power, and finish in balance. If you can do those four things, you'll achieve consistency with power. Now, the one thing people don't talk too much about is number two. How do you create momentum? Because power only happens at a very small spot in your game. We're talking about creating momentum, and that only happens three ways. Your body mass moving forward, your foot speed, and the length of your swing. Those are the three correct ways to create momentum. If you don't use one of those three, the only other power source available to you throwing a bowling ball is your shoulder. And we will show you why that's not the right source. Now from the stance, we go to the push away. And the push away has always been kind of a controversial thing because there's so many different styles taught in the push away. Some are fairly famous. We have the hinge, we have over the bar, we have on the inside, and guess what? I think they're all right. I don't think any one's better than the other. And how do I know this? Because there's so many different styles in the Hall of Fame. Some push it earlier, some push it later, some push it straight out, some push it straight down. And guess what? They're all good bowlers. So I'm not really concerned how you put the ball into your swing. I'm concerned about a few other things. What are my rules for the push away? I want you to stay tall, and I want your shoulder to stay quiet. And why do I do that? If you can stay tall and keep your shoulder quiet the entire length of your push away, you will create a smooth and consistent downswing. Now, what do I mean by downswing, and why is it so important? Let's start by looking at Linda Barnes. In watching Linda's first two steps, you'll notice that her push away is extended quite a bit, but that her right shoulder stays quiet during the push away and the downswing. Now, Linda's been told throughout her entire career that her push away is too long, but guess what? Linda is very slight in stature and needs a long push away to create a long swing so she can generate extra power. But even though her push away is long, she never moves her shoulder during the push away and the downswing. Why is this important? Because it sets up all the good positions that will happen throughout the rest of her approach. Linda's smooth downswing allows her feet to get moving so she can generate all the extra momentum that she needs. It allows her pivot step to get right underneath her head so she can hit the timing spot. It allows her spine tilt to remain consistent so she has a consistent release point, which then leads to a balanced finish. So, even though Linda's push away is longer than most bowlers, because she keeps her shoulder quiet throughout, it doesn't cause her to get out of position and sets her up to hit all the other fundamental positions later in the approach. Now let's look at Chris's push away. Chris 
pushes the ball away much later than most bowlers. You'll notice that Chris doesn't even start pushing the ball until his second step is almost complete. This would cause most bowlers to grab the ball back into their swing. Chris doesn't do that. Watch how quiet and smooth Chris's shoulder remains as he pushes the ball into the downswing. What this does for Chris is that it allows his pivot step to get directly under his head, which sets him up for his long slide. Now let's see what happens when Chris's shoulder doesn't remain quiet through the pushaway. Notice on this shot how Chris's shoulder moves down as he pushes the ball away. This causes his weight to move forward, causing his pivot step to shorten so that his head is slightly more forward. From here, Chris will be a little bit late at the timing spot. His head will be in front of his knee and he'll have to pull the ball through with his shoulder. This causes him to lose power, but it also causes him to increase his speed. Not a good combination. You can see by the difference in the ball motion on these two shots that even though he hits the pocket on the second shot, his ball doesn't hit the pins nearly as hard as it does on the first shot where his shoulder stayed quiet during the push away. This is exactly the same flaw, by the way, that Chris struggled with for years on television. But now that he understands the source of this issue, he's been able to focus on keeping his shoulder quiet through the push away and downswing, and his results in pressure situations have improved dramatically. Now let's look at Tommy Jones' push away. Tommy is the exact opposite of Chris in that he pushes the ball away extremely early. But you'll notice that even though the push away starts earlier, Tommy also keeps his shoulder quiet throughout. Just like our other two bowlers, this sets Tommy up for everything that needs to happen for the rest of the shot. The feet get going, the pivot step gets under his head, the swing matches at the timing spot, the spine tilt remains consistent, and the ball comes off his hand in perfect position for consistency and power, and his finished position is perfectly balanced. So in talking about the push away, what's another reason I want your shoulder to stay tall and I want the push away to be soft? Because I'm a numbers guy. What I mean by that is, every shot you throw, there's 100% effort given. Now where did I get that number? I didn't make it up myself. There's a very famous coach from UCLA basketball named John Wooden, coach in the 60s and the 70s. He won a lot of NC2A titles. And what Coach Wooden believed in, every athletic endeavor you use, there's 100% effort given. Whether it's good or bad, it can only add to 100. So let's take your bowling shot. So you're going to throw a bowling ball. Every shot you throw, there's 100% effort given. How much energy are you using in the first step or two steps, whether you take four or five? What do I think the optimum numbers are? The pro level, if you use 10% or less in your first step or two steps, you will save 90% for the good stuff. But conversely, if you use a lot of effort to start, 30, 40, even 50% in the beginning of your approach, if it has to add up to 100, you don't have much left. If your push away is fast and your first move is a lot of tilt, you're burning energy early. What's that gonna mean? You're not gonna have much ball speed and you're not gonna have much rev rate. So you want to use the least amount of effort possible to get started. And here's what it looks like.
recapping the push away, we agreed there isn't one way that's better than the other, but there are a couple things I look for. My rules. I want your shoulder to stay tall, and I want your push away to be soft. Why? If you can accomplish those two things, you won't burn any energy early in your game. And number two, your downswing will be smooth and consistent, which will allow your feet to walk by the ball. So, from the push away, we go directly to the swing path. I like to measure the swing path in four places. In your stance, the bottom of your swing, top of your swing, and at release. Now in your stance, I don't want it directly under your head, I want it slightly to the side. But the other three places, I'd like the ball covering your head, especially the last two. If the ball can be on the line with your head or covering your head in the top of your swing, and then come off under your head at release, guess what? You're going to be a very accurate player. If we look at Chris Barnes, you'll notice he does this very, very well. So when I work with Chris, one of the things we don't work on very often is Chris hitting his target. He's always been known as a very accurate player. These are the reasons why. But if on the top of your swing, the ball doesn't cover your head, and on the bottom of your swing, it doesn't cover your head again, you're always going to have a problem throwing the ball the same way three times in a row on the same direction. This would be from the direction side of the circle. We've got to work on probably your footwork. Remember this, I've never seen a bowler with a great swing and bad footwork. Let's start by looking at Chris Barnes, who from the back just about has perfect fundamentals. Measuring his ball position at the four spots I measure from, you'll notice that the ball starts inside his body in a stance, comes directly under his head at the bottom of the swing, covers his head at the top of the swing, and then comes directly under his head at the bottom as the ball is coming off his hand. This allows the swing to not only line up with the target path, but also allows Chris to fire the ball through along the target line for maximum power. You'll notice how close the ball is to Chris's ankle as it comes through and that his hand is directly in the center of the ball, which allows him to rotate his hand for a very strong release. These are textbook positions that every bowler should strive for in the swing path. Now I mentioned earlier that the most important spots where the ball should cover the head during the swing path are at the top of the swing and at the bottom of the swing as the ball comes off the hand. And Tommy Jones is a perfect example of that. You'll notice that even though the ball is not perfectly under Tommy's head at the bottom of the swing, as the ball comes back, he is able to get it into the perfect position at the top which allows him to fire from the top of his swing, which gives him all that extra speed and rev rate that he's known for. What if the ball doesn't cover your head in those two key spots? What happens? Well, let's have a look at our amateur bowler, Matt. Remember how in the stance, Matt allowed the ball to peek out to the right when we were looking at him from behind? Remember how this caused his push away to go to the right, which then caused the swing to wrap behind him at the top? Remember how that caused Matt's slide to go back to the right? And even though it does that, the ball is still too far from his ankle, it did not come through under his head, and it forced his hand into a weak position at release. Well, obviously that's a problem. And the fix for Matt can be in a few different places. We've already talked about the stance and the push away as possible places to fix this problem, but another solution would be in the footwork. We'll discuss that next. So, bottom line, why is measuring the swing path so important? It tells me so much about your direction or your ability to hit a target. We've looked at the stance. We've looked at the push away. We looked at the swing path. If you're still struggling to have great direction or hit your target on a consistent basis, we now have to look in the footwork. So, as we go from the swing path to the footwork, I need to warn you, I'm a big footwork guy. A famous coach in the 40s once said, the only thing touching the approach are your feet. That's why your footwork is so important. And guess what? I believe that. Now, there are two areas we're going to look at in regards to footwork. First off is the direction, meaning how do you get from where you start in the approach to where you slide? That's your direction. 
The second thing we're going to look at is the rhythm and the tempo in which you get there, how fast or how slow your feet are. So when talking about footwork, let's look at direction first. When I watch somebody bowl, I'm really looking at three spots in their footwork. I'm looking at the crossover step, I'm looking at their pivot step, and I'm looking at their slide. Let's start with a crossover step. The crossover step is the first step in a four step delivery, the second step in a five step delivery, and the third step in a six step delivery. What I'm looking for here is for the foot to go slightly in front of the other foot. I don't want to cross way over the other foot, just slightly in front of it and a little bit in to out. And why is this important? Because it gives your swing somewhere to go after the push away. If your crossover step doesn't cross over, then there's no way you get the ball under your shoulder and head on the downswing, which increases the likelihood that your swing path will be offline later. But if you do allow your step to cross over, it dramatically increases your chances of the ball covering your head at the top of the swing, which, as we saw as we talked about the swing path, is extremely important in determining the consistency of your direction as well as maximizing your power. Now, let's look at the pivot step. Now, I believe the pivot step is the most important part of the game. Why? because at this point, you're getting ready to throw the ball. This is where all your momentum loads up so you can put power on the ball. So I look at the pivot step from two different angles. First, from the back. And what am I looking for? I want to see your pivot step slightly inside your head. Why? Because when your pivot step is slightly inside your head and the ball's at the top of your swing, there is no other body part in the way of your swing. This is where the momentum really kicks in. If you're able to get into this position, then you can accelerate the ball from the top of your swing through the release. This will maximize momentum and power. Another way to look at this is if your pivot step goes on the outside of your head, then you can't begin accelerating until the ball clears the body part. You can't have momentum if your body's in the way, which gives the ball a lot less time to build up speed and throws the swing offline. There is no way a shot is going to have a very high rev rate, a lot of speed, or good direction if your pivot step is to the right of your head. Now, looking at the pivot step from the side, what am I looking for? I'm looking for the head and the pivot step to match. Why? Because if the pivot step comes in directly under the head, the bowler is in complete balance and ready to drive into the release with maximum power. The most common problem I see with bowlers in their pivot step is that their head gets in front of the step, which in almost every case leads to early timing. And bowlers with early timing tend to struggle with keeping their ball speed up and generating power. The last thing I look at when we're talking about footwork is your slide. From the back, what I like to see is your slide occur on the same board as your pivot step. I know, that sounds really hard but there's a couple of things that actually make it easier. First, if the ball is covering your head at the top of your swing and your pivot step is slightly inside your head, then your chances of sliding on the same board as your pivot step go up dramatically. So the second part of footwork is your tempo or the rhythm. Another way to look at it, how good or great is your foot speed? Now I'm gonna ask everybody a question at home. There is a right or wrong answer to this according to my system. Is it better to have your feet a little bit quicker than your swing or should your swing be a little bit quicker than your feet? I think the answer is one. I think your foot speed should be slightly greater than your swing speed. And why? If you do that, you generate more of the power from your lower body than you do from your upper body. And that leads us back into our second thing, the numbers again, 100% effort. Now, when you watch me give a lesson, you'll notice from time to time, I like to sit down. I'm not sitting down because I'm tired. I'm not sitting down because I'm not hyper. By those watching the DVD for the first time realize I talk pretty quick. Well, my mind's working that fast. I'm sitting down because I'm 6'4 and I'm tall. 
I'm trying to get below your hips. I want to see how much effort is being used in your lower body compared to your upper body. And the reason why I do that, I think there's an optimum number for this. The pro number, 70% lower body, 30% upper body. If you do that, your feet can't be slow. Now I've just said a few things. I've never once said your feet should be fast. Don't misconstrue this. I'm just saying your foot speed needs to be slightly greater than your swing speed. What is the number one tip given in bowling? Slow your feet down. And how do I know this? Because a lot of you ride it on your shoes. I have no problem with that tip. But the problem they don't tell you is, if you're gonna slow your feet down, you gotta slow your swing down. Let's talk about that from the number standpoint. If you buy into my 70-30 number, 70% lower body, 30% upper body, and you slow your feet down, what have you done? You've changed the ratios. You made the 70 a smaller number. If it has to add to 100, that means the upper body number has to go up. And when that number goes up, where does it go up? It goes right into your shoulder. Nobody has ever, ever made the Hall of Fame with slow feet and a fast swing. So I know when you go to Facebook and you post your game on Facebook and you get all those coaches, the number one tip, slow your feet down. I'm not sure that's the right tip. So in going from footwork to the timing spot, there's another reason why you want your foot speed to be slightly greater than your swing speed. Why? It allows you to get to the timing spot much easier. Now what is a timing spot? I measure timing when your slide foot gets flat in front of your head, the swing should be parallel to the floor. Now why did I come up with this? I had to have a system and a way of measuring that didn't matter if you were male or female, had a lot of ball speed or no ball speed, had a high rev rate or a medium rev rate or even a low rev rate and you had a lot of tilt or you stayed behind the ball. This timing spot allows a lot of different styles to match up. Why else is this important? Because I tried to teach timing the way everybody was taught. You measure timing in your push away. If you move the ball on a four step approach, if the ball and your foot went exactly at the same time, you were in time. Now if your foot went and the ball went down, you had early timing. Or if you moved your foot and the ball didn't go, you had late timing. Now looking at our models, Chris, Tommy, and Linda, you will see they have three different times they push the ball away. They're all going in the first ballot hall of fame, so obviously you can't measure timing in the push away. As I've mentioned several times throughout the DVD, the timing spot is really the centerpiece of the system. It's the first hall of fame position I developed when I came up with my system. But the reason it became such a useful tool in coaching was the opposite fact. The bowlers who struggle with achieving consistency and power could not get into the timing spot. So what happens in those cases? Well, there are only three things that can happen when you're looking at the timing spot. The bowler either matches up, he's late, or he's early. Let's talk about late timing first. Tommy Jones sometimes struggles with late timing, which is also very common in the young athletic power player. As you can see here, when Tommy lets his shoulder drop down early, he's going to really pull the ball up into a swing, which makes his swing even longer than usual. And when his slide foot gets flat in front of his head, his swing is still above parallel, which means his timing is late. His shoulder then over rotates to try and save the shot, but he misses inside the target with more speed and more rotation, which causes the ball to miss farther right down lane with more speed. And that results in either two things, a flat 10 or the dreaded 2810. The fix for this problem goes back to something we talked about when we looked at the push away. If you can keep your shoulder quiet during the push away and downswing, then you won't have to pull the ball up, which in turn makes you pull the ball down, then you will have late timing. Now let's look at the opposite example, early timing. And for this one, let's have a look at Barry Asher's game. Early timing is a problem that I see mostly with bowlers who have either lost or never had a lot of physical strength or struggle with physical limitations such as a lack of flexibility or prior injuries. In Barry's case, he also grew up in an era when the balls didn't hook as much. So early timing 
helped his ball get into a roll. So looking at Barry from the side, you'll notice how far Barry's head is in front of his foot in the pivot step. And as soon as I see this, I know the bowler is going to have early timing. Spine tilt is the final piece of the puzzle when we talk about the timing spot. What is spine tilt? Spine tilt is a measurement of the angle of your spine at various points during the approach. The most important part of the approach where I look at spine tilt is from the timing spot to the release point. In general, I like to see the angle of the spine in the 25 to 55 degree range. Anywhere within that range is fine with me. But the most important thing I measure is how much the spine angle changes from the timing spot to the finish position. What I like to see is less than 10 degrees of change in these two positions. Notice how our models, Chris, Tommy, and Linda, keep their spine angle consistent all the way through this area. What does this accomplish? It allows the release point to be very consistent, which gives you a very consistent launch angle, which leads to consistent speed control. And if you have consistent direction and consistent speed control, your chances of being a very good bowler get higher and higher. Over the course of giving lessons to thousands of bowlers, one of the things I've noticed, some bowlers have a hard time getting to the timing spot due to physical limitations. Now there could be multiple reasons why that is, or in Barry's case, you learn to bowl in a different era. But there are things we can do if you have early timing to still throw consistent, powerful shots. Now remember when we looked at Barry from the side, how he was early in the timing spot? Let's watch what happens as he comes into release. The first thing you'll notice is that his shoulders will start to come slightly back, which is usually where things will go wrong with someone with early timing. But Barry is able to keep his hips level from the timing spot all the way through the release. What this does, it allows him to have a consistent release point as well as a constant launch angle. Then as Barry comes into the fall through, look how his head stays directly over his knee. His balance is perfect. Now when talking about the hip staying level, whether you have early timing, late timing, or perfect timing, keep your hips level from the timing spot through the release point. From the back, let's look how straight Barry's slide is. As we talked about before in the footwork, we want the slide to come in straight and on the same board as a pivot step. Barry does this perfectly. As he comes through the release, his body is completely balanced on his slide leg, which allows his swing to come through right along the target line. So if you're a bowler who struggles with early timing, for whatever reason, follow Barry's lead. Keep your hips level, slide straight, and you too can throw consistent, powerful shots in your game. So the final topic for us to look at in the system is the finish position. And what am I looking for here? I'm looking for that universal sign of a great shot. And what is that? When a bowler is completely posted and the only thing is swinging is his throwing arm. But to me, the finish position is about so much more. Remember, I see things in a circle. So if you can hit all those spots in the circle, you will automatically be in that great finish position. But there are two things I do look for in the finish position. First, I look for that relationship between your knee and your head. Remember when we said that one of the Hall of Fame positions is where your head is in relation to your knee at the finish? Look at where our four models are at this point. This is what I teach. I don't want your head past your knee at release. Why? Because you don't play sports with your weight in your head and your shoulders. If you get all of your weight in your head and your shoulders and they get past your knee, you will fall out of balance. The best way to play sports is with your weight in your core and below. Why? Because this allows you to be in the most consistent, powerful positions possible. 
Let's have a look at our amateur bowler Matt and compare his balance on two different shots side by side. In the shot on the left, you'll notice how Matt gets to the timing spot, his hips stay down, and his head stays above his knee. His arm comes through straight and his elbow faces the target. In the shot on the right, he loses the ball early because his hips come up and his head comes forward in front of his knee. Now let's look at the ball motion on those two shots. On the first one, the ball picks up where he wants it to and it goes through the pins with plenty of power. On the other shot, he still hits the pocket, but since the ball didn't have as much on it, he isn't able to carry and leaves a weak 10. As you can see, it's not a huge difference, but it's enough to cause Matt to go from striking to leaving a 10 pin. Now the other Hall of Fame position that occurs at this point is the back leg gap. And what am I looking for here? Basically, it's just a measure of how much space is between your slide leg and your trail leg at release. And why do I look at this spot? Because it's another way for me to tell where the weight is distributed at the release point. But there are really two things I look for here. One is the space between the front and back leg. The most important thing here is that the legs aren't touching which makes the shoulders pull back and the bowler's launch angle too steep. And that the back leg is under the hip and not so far behind the hip that the bowler's weight gets too far forward. And the other thing I'm looking for is whether or not the back foot has spun down. If it hasn't, then too much of the weight will be left on the back leg, meaning the bowler hasn't transferred all of his energy into the ball. What I'd like to see is exactly what our models do. The back foot has spun down, meaning the weight has come off the back leg, transferred to the front leg, and the core of all the bowler's energy has gone into the ball. This is how you throw your most powerful and consistent shots. And this is the universal look of a bowler who has just thrown their best shot. So I'm sure some of you realize we're almost at the very end of the DVD and I haven't mentioned the word release yet. And there's a reason why. If I can fix your rhythm, if I can fix your timing, if I can get you to the bottom of the swing in the right body position, guess what? You'll have a very strong and a very consistent release. Another way of looking at it, like a jigsaw puzzle. I see the release as the last piece of the puzzle. Well, you can't do a puzzle by putting the middle piece in first. You have to do the border and all the pieces around it. Once you get all that done, the last piece is easy. That's how I see release. But if you do want a tip, the right hip has so much to do with the strength of your release. Now, Chris Barnes and I will talk about that more in detail. So another reason why we're talking about the release so late in the DVD is simple. When you throw a bowling ball, the last thing you feel is the ball coming off your hand. All the feedback on your good shots and more importantly your bad shots are in your hand. Now let's talk about the shots that you don't like. Bowlers are very easy to tell when they didn't throw it the way they want it. They have this look walking back from the approach to the set tee. Didn't quite throw it the way I want it. Hand came over the top. And then you start talking out loud. I didn't stay behind the ball. I turned it early. I came on top of it. I missed it. My elbow got around it. Or, or the one that everybody talks about the most, I chicken winged it. And guess what? Those are all the correct self-diagnosis. But your hand isn't the culprit. Your hand didn't cause any of those misses. Something somewhere else in your game had to go wrong for that feel not to be correct in your hand. I think it's the right hip. Now Chris and I are going to talk about it in more detail why the right hip has so much to do with having consistent and a strong release. So before we show how the right hip has so much to do with a consistent and strong release, we have to quantify a few things. First, Chris's arm has one length from his shoulder to his fingertips. That length stays one piece the entire time he throws a ball. Number two, when you throw a ball, the ball's in an arc. From the top of your swing through your bottom of your swing, the ball never leaves its arc. 
it's too heavy and moving too fast. So if Chris were to get to the bottom of the swing and his right hip comes up, the ball doesn't go up and stay in the middle of his hand and then go forward again. That's not what happens. Now let's talk about when his right hip stays down, he throws the ball correctly. Now this also helps by being in the timing spot. It gives you the best chance of your right hip staying down. So Chris is here, he goes to throw the ball, and his right hip goes down as he goes into his slide. It automatically keeps his elbow tucked and his hand behind the ball. And when you do this, you keep your right shoulder out of the shot, and more importantly, his head stays behind his knee at release. As he comes through release, you can see his hand. He's going to have excellent launch angle, excellent speed control, and more importantly, the target on the lane never moves. So his ability to hit that target on the same direction goes way up. So now let's look what happens when the right hip doesn't stay down. He gets to the bottom of the swing, his right hip goes up, and when your right hip goes up, it rolls your shoulder forward and in, and it makes your head go in front of your knee. Now if you look at it back here, more importantly, now his elbow is not near his side, and now his thumb is in front of the fingers. Now we talked about the ball not leaving in the arc. When his hip goes up, the ball stays in the arc, but his hand rolls up on top of the ball. This is where the weak release comes from, and this is the cause of the flying elbow. So now the ball is wanting to go more down than forward. And when you get in this position, the same guy wins every time, Sir Isaac Newton. The ball is getting pulled down by gravity, not going forward with your hand. When he gets here, the thumb gets in front of the fingers. The only way the ball will come off your hand is if you pop your elbow around. He can follow through on the inside, or he can fan it off to the right but he can't follow through towards his target because your shoulder socket doesn't work this way. The ball's away from his hip, it's in a different angle going the lane, and it's gonna hit the target in a different direction. That's why the right hip is so key to having a consistent and powerful release. That's how I see it as a coach. Chris, as a bowler, what does it feel like? No, I think all of us bowlers have felt that shot to where we just can't catch it at the bottom. It's the most frustrating thing Many of us have been told, including myself, that I just turned it early. Now I know that I didn't turn it early, I just turned it from the wrong position. So if there's one thing you can take from this DVD, it's this. Now on tour, when I really wanted a shot, I would lean a little bit forward, and at that point, I was already out of position. My center of gravity would get up in my shoulders, and no matter how steady I stayed, I never got my head back behind my knee. So my hand was a little bit more on top of it, my rev rate would go down, my launch angles would change a little bit. The lanes were hard, it's two pin, two ten, bucket. The lanes were easy, half seven, half ten. So then I might try and catch it a little bit more the next time and create a different mistake. So now what I focus on is staying tall in those first couple of steps, keeping my center of gravity in my core and out of my shoulders, and then using the back foot spin to keep my right hip down, which keeps my elbow in and my shoulder back. Now, my best shots in pressure situations are the same as my best shots early in the game. I think if you focus on these two things, you will also throw your best shots no matter what the circumstance. I couldn't have said it better myself. And that's my system. Now you know everything about the system I use on a daily basis to help bowlers. I believe the reason I've been able to help so many bowlers, when they come to me with a problem, I take their game, I put it into my system, I find the problem, and then I find a solution to make their game better. But it is a process. Just because you're throwing the ball great one day doesn't mean that goes on forever. If Hall of Fame caliber bowlers such as Chris Barnes, Tommy Jones, Linda Barnes, and Barry Asher still come to me to sharpen their games, that means none of us is immune from a bad habit creeping into our game from time to time. But now you have the system. You have a leg up on how to fix the problem yourself. Now you too can enjoy this great game of bowling for as long as possible. Thank you.
one of the most common mistakes I see in the push away is the overextended push away. Now, when we looked at Linda, one of our models in the DVD, her push away is the entire length of her arm, but her shoulder stays quiet. What do I see a lot of bowlers who have early timing and low ball speed? The overextended push away, which looks something like this. They extend it out and then their shoulder drops down before the ball's finished its downswing. Remember, the push away is here and the downswing is smooth. But if you let your shoulder go forward and it goes here and then you come down, the ball actually stops here. Now you have to pull the ball up into your swing and that's now raised your hips up and in your pivot step, you're standing straight up and down. Now you go to get down into your slide and you collapse onto your left knee. Look where my hand is. It's on top of the ball. People that have a push away that goes too far and let their shoulders go too far always have early timing, a problem with balance, a problem with speed, and a lack of power. So we've already talked about slow feet. My second favorite tip is the one where people give and they're trying to get low. Now I always ask the same question, how low? What do you mean? Well, how low is low? Remember, low isn't a destination, it's just low. And they say it all the time, the person's trying to get low, she needs to get lower. Because this is very, very prevalent among the young girls who bowl, the 21 and unders, the girls trying to get low. I don't get it because low doesn't define a place. I'm an empirist. I want a definition of where it should be. I don't think low is very effective. Here's why. When I was 25 and a pretty good bowler back in the day, low meant this. I got my right leg to bend and I got pretty low to the approach. Now that I'm 53, here's what low, low means to me. Obviously not the same thing. So when people are trying to get low, I see them doing it in three places. The first place they do it is in their stance. Some people tend to get really, really, really low in their stance. I couldn't disagree with this more. Why? Their very first move is they stand up. But there are some exceptions. There are a couple of bowlers who are some of the best bowlers in the world who bend their knees quite a bit in their stance. They get here. But what do they all have in common? They never ever get higher than this. They maintain their knee flex the entire approach. That I agree with. What's the other place bowlers try to get low? In their pivot step. I see bowlers who get so low in their pivot step that if their swing came through, their swing would bottom out and double dribble the approach. Now obviously, that's too low. And also the people that have their really low knee bend in the pivot step, they tend to stand straight up at release and they drop the ball in the lane. But my favorite is that last step getting low. Especially the young girls I see bowl. Why are girls who are 15 wearing knee braces already? because their pivot step is straight up and down, and in an effort to get low, they collapse on their left knee in the very last step. They collapse on it. So guess what? All their momentum is now going into the foul line. The last time I looked, the pins were 60 feet away. The momentum needs to be going forward. That's why I believe your hips stay level from some knee bend in your pivot step through your slide, it'll be much more effective. Remember, I have no problem getting low as long as you can define it.